a whole new series that we're doing in the divine will components of the Carmelite model of the spiritual journey and how the divine will, the language of it and the journey of the divine will modifies but also builds upon those very elements. Well, welcome back once again to Bite by Bite, our journey into this gift of the divine will. I'm Larry Leopold. I'm with Dr. Lois Grandi, a uh, certified uh, behavioral counselor. And we're both Carmelites, right? and we're both following this gift of the divine will, trying to learn and live in it. So welcome back to our episode 34. As we move now through a series of introducing to you exemplars, those who were either um, influenced by those who directly heard from God or who through their own spirituality and closeness, holiness with God and their learning, were able to uh, receive this gift of the divine will within themselves. So today we're talking about Bishop Luis Martinez, who was the spiritual director to Conchita, right, that mother of 12, who uh, also was very much receiving the, this information directly from Jesus about the gift of the divine will. Now, Bishop Martinez, you may be familiar if you've read many of his books, like The Sanctifiers, the one that I just am in love with. And he found the joy of living in the divine will. As you can tell, just looking at his face, okay? He's a poster child for what it looks like to live in the divine will. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. Lewis? <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. Yes. <laughs> so as we, as we begin to just kind of share with you uh, his life, his story, and his understanding of this gift that a bishop in the Catholic Church has has helped us in our own learning how to how to live in this gift, right? It's a remarkable gift of the Holy Spirit. But let's begin with the prayer. If you would, please, Lois. Oh, absolutely. Father, we come before you <clears throat> on this beautiful day. And we are blessing you and thanking you for the opportunity to share with your people about this beautiful gift of the divine will and other mystics that we studied, the mystics understanding of how it works and what it means to them and the fullness of the gift. And we ask the Holy Spirit to be poured out among Larry and me and all those listening in a special way today for all of our needs and to deepen our understanding in our own personal lives of the gift that you have given us and the gift that you want to deepen in us and bring us to that deeper understanding of the beauty and the knowledges and, and all that <clears throat> that is involved in your giftedness. We ask Holy Mary, little Louisa, and Teresa, <clears throat> the little flower, to pray for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, and so as we have uh, Bishop's picture up here, and yeah. we would like to get some context. He, he actually was a contemporary of Louisa, although he'd never, never heard of her, never read his her writings, uh, but as she, uh, he and, and Conchita both were having the Holy Spirit talk to them. So, Lois, would you give us a, a sense of, of when he lived? What happened to him? Because I think the Lord was preparing him for this, wasn't he? Absolutely. <laughs> and how, how was his life? Uh, share a little bit of his story. Okay. And before I, before I share that, just a a word I wanted to mention that in Father Ayanusi's book, uh, Splendor of Creations, page 125, Father Ayanusi references uh, Archbishop Martinez along with other mystics, and he references them by saying that these are the 20th century mystics, their approved writings, and they are describing the actualization of this gift of the divine will how it actualizes in our own lives, sort of the context of it, putting my own words on that. And he's talking about, they characterize the new mystical union of wills. They call it by different names. We'll find out later that Bishop Martinez 
called it the mystical incarnation, as did Conchita. But other mystics that we'll be talking about and have talked about, like Elizabeth of the Trinity and little Therese, have called it something different. They have different names for it. Uh, Elizabeth of the Trinity calls it the indwelling. <clears throat> Later on, maybe we'll talk about Dina Balanche. She calls it divine substitution. But it isn't so much what they call it, because as, as Larry, as you pointed out, they're understanding it really directly from the Holy Spirit. So it isn't so much what they call it, but it's very important how they describe it and what they tell us about it. And that's why we open the door to take a little, a little detour from our Carmelite mansions to go into the exemplars for a bit to, to just really um, let us know and a deeper understanding that the gift of the divine will can be talked about and explained in many different ways by the people who have received it. Yeah. Yes, and again, I love that because Father Anusi also teaches us that the mystics would hear what God would say in God mm -hmm. words but how they could communicate it was based on their culture, their education, their spirituality, uh, all those contexts about our humanity. And so to have someone as eminent as Bishop Luis Martinez, who was yeah. extremely learned and holy, who also traveled the road of the Carmelite journey, uh, is yeah. an exceptional gift for all of us, which we'll be going to again and again, right? So how did he begin? All right, so Bishop Martinez, just give you a little bit of his biography. As I was um, preparing some of the material on the divine will on how he talks about it, what, what occurred to me, as I shared with Larry earlier before the broadcast, what occurred to me that it's hard to understand Bishop Martinez outside of the context of the culture and the times in which he lived. So I want to just touch a little bit on his life and also by that smile, by that joy that's emanating from him in the picture, as you can see it, you might not guess that his life was one of, of course, incredible joy and happiness, but very piercing sorrow because he was the archbishop in Mexico at the time in 1914 and then 1926 when the persecution of the Catholic Church increased and it became a crime to celebrate the sacraments. It was a capital crime. And so priests were gathered up, they were arrested, they were interrogated, they were tortured, and they were martyred. And one of the martyrs that we all might know is Father Miguel Pro. He's fairly famous. He was a, a father and he did many different disguises so that he could go around and minister to the people of Mexico and so that he can say, celebrate masses with them in those disguises. You know, he would, he would go like that. And they uh, caught him, he was betrayed, they arrested him and, and they shot him. And he's, he's fairly famous, but there were many like that. So Father Martinez, Archbishop Martinez is living in that time. He's the head eventually of a church of 4 million Catholics in Mexico with all the responsibilities and the duties and the heaviness that that must entail. So it belies his joy that we're seeing. I just wanted to point out that this is the man who had incredible happiness and joy in the midst of incredible um, temptations and incredible anguish and incredible concern for the church and the faith of the Mexican people. His deepest fears, he talks um, in, the, in biography by Trevino, Father Trevino, talks about his deepest fear is that Mexican people, that Mexico would lose the faith through this persecution. And in another place, I was reading that Father Martinez is credited with really repairing and helping the church to recover from the persecution once it had um, died down, once it was over, that recovery. So Bishop Martinez, would you like me to tell you about his early life a little bit? All right, and so uh, as he is, is going through this joy, he's, 
you know, he's also living in hiding, right? And so he experiences great misery and yeah. but exclaims, now I'm living as in heaven. Oh, yeah. what delicacy. God treats me. He inebriates me with love in the midst of the storm. Mm -hmm. right? the mm -hmm. tempest again in the exactly. persecution of the church. Right? Exactly. So for us, what a what an encouragement there. And what a, uh, a an affirmation that yeah. as we grow in the divine will, that this joy is what is coming. Okay. Exactly. And so here Father, we are. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Father Martinez, um, before before the persecution, what happened is he was born in 11 days later, his father died and he was sent and was adopted, so to speak, by a maternal uncle who then died seven years later and then another uncle and he died. So we had a lot of early deaths and he entered the minor seminary when he was nine years old, very young, and then took other priests as his mentor, but many of them died also. So we had a lot of sorrow in his early life with that. And then as he's moving up, I think he was ordained a priest, I think it was 1904. And then as he's moving up 10 years later, 1914, you have the unprecedented persecution of Catholics and other Christians, I'm sure, in Mexico. That was right on his doorstep. And he talks about that. He talks about amidst, as Larry was saying, amidst that great suffering, the thing that surprised him the most is he said, Jesus is in my heart. He goes, how can I be so sad when God is celebrating a feast in my heart? That's how he explains it. God is celebrating a feast in my heart. So how can I be sad? And his hiding out, he hid out in a garden next to a convent that belonged to the Little Sisters of the Poor for a whole spring. He healed that hid out in a garden. And what happened is somebody, they had an informant betray the sisters to tell you know what they were doing. And um, the government kicked the sisters out on the street. And so at that time, Archbishop Martinez had to find another hiding place. So he went through a a many year period where priest had to hide and he was one of them, of course, that had to hide. All right. And so as he was hiding, and this was like, what, in 1927? Yes. Right? yes. This experience with the little flowers story of the soul. Okay. He had a couple experiences. When he was hiding, he says he, on March 25th, 1927, the Feast of the Annunciation, he got this gift and he was talking about it as the mystical marriage, which it may have been, but later on he describes it in a way that makes it look a lot like the, what they call mystical incarnation. So the way that they describe um, him and Conchita, I'll put them two together for now. The way that they describe the mystical incarnation is is like an image of the hypostatic union where Jesus is mystically enfleshed in us, analogous to how he came to Mary in the Annunciation. And both of them received this gift, which we'll call the gift of the divine will, the MI, they call it, the mystical incarnation, on, on a March 25th. His was March 25th, 1927. And, um, Conchita's, I believe, was a few years earlier than that. But it both came on the Feast of the Annunciation, I think, to help them understand that this was not only a new grace, but the nature of the grace, that you're becoming a mother to Jesus, like in Scripture, when he says, those who do the will of God are my mother, my brothers, all of that. You're, you're now embracing that with this gift, we're becoming the mother of Jesus. And because we're the mother of Jesus, as Father Martinez talks about it later, we become this spiritual motherhood, the mother of souls. So you have this um, fruitfulness at the end of this gift. The gift involves union with Jesus Christ. It involves being transformed in love into his image. 
It involves reproducing the mysteries of the life of Jesus, especially his interior life, which he tells Conchita, not, not very many people know of the interior suffering that he had from the moment of his conception, but those in divine will will go through the different stages of that interior life of Jesus that is not well known. Right, and so as he was being almost instructed directly, my God, all right, through this process, he was experiencing things that we can see very clearly. Those of us in the divine will see the parallel to what was happening in Louisa. Right? And yeah. these are just years after Louisa has now had the gift um, so uh, sealed within her that it was made available to the whole world. Mm -hmm. So this grace it was shining out and touching mm -hmm. Cheetah and Bishop Cartinas. Yes. So, so as he would describe what he experienced in this gift, what were the words he would use? The words that he would use would be in this gift, again, you, he called it unitive, that you're made one with Jesus, mm -hmm. you're reproducing his life, the life of Christ is reproduced within you, and it called possession, possession of God, possession of the Holy Spirit, possession of God's will. And then he called it fruitfulness. At the end, you have a spiritual maternity, a fecundity, as they call it, a fruitfulness. And when you go through the mansions, going back to Teresa for a minute, the seven mansions, when one gets to the seventh mansion, that's when she identifies that there's a spiritual fruitfulness because of the union with Jesus. In this gift, it's part of the gift, that spiritual fecundity, that f spiritual fruitfulness. And that's how he would, he would describe it. Now, he used different names to try and describe this as well, as we've heard this uh, mystical incarnation, which we will look at a little later. Right? Yeah. But now he also talks about the marvelous exchange. Could you describe that for us? Yes, and, and what, and you have that up on the screen <clears throat> here. What he's talking about, he's, he's giving us a definition by what he means by what happens in this mystical incarnation, right? Actualizing it. And he says there's an exchange of wills whereby our soul um, turns away from, I'll use my own words, I'll paraphrase it, turns away from the independent use of our human will. And what that means is it, it doesn't mean that we don't use our human will. It means that we turn away from using it independent of God's light and God's leading and the Holy Spirit's guidance. So we're turning away from using our will in a way that we're refusing the light that Jesus gives us. And that's what the independent use of one's will is, that you're just going ahead and saying, hey, I want this, I need this, we're going to do this. And you're really not you're not considering, you're not factoring into what might be the will of the Father here, what might be what the Holy Spirit is guiding you to do in his incredible gentleness, <laughs> you know, guiding your actions. You're just kind of turning away from that, almost like strong-willed, almost like you're just running it over and being strong-willed and going your own direction. And this new gift presupposes that we will stay under, as much as it's possible, that we will stay under the gentle guidance of the Holy Spirit and refer our life to him as much as we can. Because what we're asking is we're asking to be led, not just in any way, but to be led in what is God's highest will. So to do that, one has to stay attuned and stay under, if you will, the influence of the Holy Spirit. And we do that by prayer, the sacraments, and the practice of the virtues that all keeps us more or less under the wisdom, under the guidance, under the outpouring, whatever word one wants to use there, of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and I love... Again, even in this explanation here, 
how he's aligned himself, not just copying how Jesus in his humanity was living only to do the Father's will, mm -hmm. right? but mm -hmm. the very love that, the, that Jesus had for the Father that made it the motivation and the power so he could have the same will that the Father had that we, through this gift of the Holy Spirit, through the gift of the divine will, have been given access to, right? It's the same letting the Holy Spirit and the will of the Father reign in us as it did in Jesus. Exactly. And he takes that even like a step further that really is analogous to what Louisa tells us. And he says, because the Holy Spirit is now living in us, the Holy Spirit is also loving in us with his love, which is the love of the Father and the Son. And that's what makes it possible for you and me and all of us to love the Father with the love of Jesus and to love Jesus with the love of Father and the same with the Holy Spirit both ways. To love each person of the Trinity with the love of the other two people. And I would have to say, too, uh, he talks a little later on, <clears throat> we may not get into it as deeply in, in this session, but he talks about we also are incorporated into the love of Mary, the Holy Mother, not just because we're mothers of souls in this gift, but because, of course, she is integral to the gift, being the mediatrix of all graces, being our advocate being co redemptress and he uses those terms and he says this gift brings you into those um, titles that she has and not as full of course to the degree that she does them of course but we are under her in that so we become co redemptress offering the sacrifice of Jesus through us all the time with every action we become mediatrix our prayers <clears throat> and we become advocates. And of course, the Blessed Mother was able to do all of that because she was full of grace. What mm -hmm. grace was that? The grace of the gift of the divine will, exactly. which through which uh, Jesus was totally within her, even though she, she had the grace before Jesus was born in time. In the eternal now, God did an extraordinary uh, phenomenal grace of imparting all of himself within her mm -hmm. so that Jesus did it all in her. So now we hear Bishop Luis talking about how Jesus is doing it all in him. Yes. Right? The same As, gift. Exactly. As um, Bishop Martinez, as he moved up in the church, you know, the different <clears throat> dignities that one gets. He finally at the very end was asked to be primate, um, primate of Mexico, again, in charge of 4,000, 4 million Catholics. And what he says in, in the biography of Father Trevino, who wrote his biography, a friend and knew him very well, he said that um, Father, really, I mean, wouldn't the condition for accepting these new honors and dignities and promotions, if you will, is he is saying that I won't accept it unless Jesus speaks in me, works in me, directs in me, governs in me, decides everything, preaches in me, does the work entirely. <laughs> That's the only condition that I'm going to take this. And so he understood, Bishop Martinez, understood that Jesus in this new gift in this exchange of wills, in this um, mystical incarnation, he understood that Jesus had been mystically incarnated into his soul and that from that place, he would be in charge of all the activity and not just tell us what to do or tell him what to do, but actually do it so that it has an incredible efficacy because Jesus himself is doing the work with us, but he's a divine person doing the work. Amen. And so uh, he, he turned it over to Jesus altogether so that Jesus would do his work. And he said that I would do the work of Jesus, right? Yes. How beautiful yes. is that? Yeah. So here he's now going into that love that you were referring to earlier, Louis. Yes. 
talk to us about this. Okay, I love this part. Um, he talks about he talks about in this gift those souls that receive the gift of the mystical incarnation and the divine will. Right in this gift. Mm -hmm. He goes, are we not brides of the Holy Spirit? We, we're, we're spouse to the Holy Spirit. It's a spousal love. It's a, it's the love that Teresa of Avila talks about in the betrothal and the mystical marriage. It's the same love that we're talking about, right? So he says, um, is it not amazing that God possesses our hearts, the heart of the beloved, and that we possess, and this is gradual, you know, the possession is gradual as our life becomes more pure and more holy when possesses God to a greater degree. So we possess God's heart, but also that God gives us his heart. It's like he says in, in the Song of Songs that we've stolen his heart. We're, we're brides that have stolen his heart. So he gives us his heart to love with, and then Bishop Martinez goes further and says, we each love with the heart of the other. And he says, even in, in regular marriages, he says, how many, basically, how many marriages did you know where the partners really love with the heart of the other? That's just incredible, right? But he's saying in this marriage, in this union, in this spouse relationship, it is just absolutely true that God loves in us, we love in him, and we love with his heart. And so for him to to be so so giving, so generous, so little that he was able to to love with God's own love, there mm -hmm. had to be this exchange. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the exchange that when what it did in him is amazing as we see this wonderful quote mm -hmm. from Mm -hmm. oh. Wonderful. So he understood, and he says later, you know, he understood that God will live in him, not just with him, but it's God living in him. Like St. Paul's, you know, I live now, but no, not I. Jesus lives in me. Christ lives in me. He understood that very deeply, and he said, mm -hmm. God will be I, and I will be God. And it's like you can see him catching himself and thinking, oh, I want to explain this so that people do not think that we're saying we become God. That would be heresy. <laughs> so he says, not by an exchange of natures. That would be heresy. But by grace, by the transformation of love, all that is grace, right? So we become partakers in the in the divine nature, in God's nature, never by nature, always by grace. That's how we become partakers, because only Jesus is the God man. You know, we can never become him, but he gives us the grace to take on his nature and to be clothed in his nature um, completely, completely. And so this transformation that can only love can do, but the love is inseparable from the divine will. But the power and the science of love is what God is teaching us in these days. It's not what we thought. It is utterly more. Yeah. Right? And this transformation by love is what we would refer to as divinization, deification that the Book of Heaven tells us about. It is God who is love, making us one and like himself. Exactly. And he says, Bishop Martinez says, you know, do not lovers, those that love each other, lose themselves in the other person. And it talks about, you know, we don't, we don't understand at the deepest levels what love is. We, we don't understand um, that the love, when we're talking about holiness, is all about sacrifice and um, giving your heart to the other and the good of the other, thinking about the good of the other. Just like when Jesus was in his humanity, he emphasized many times that what was important to him, where the zeal was, was the glory of his father. And this meant specifically, and Bishop Martinez pointed it out, this meant specifically that Jesus was very occupied with understanding that God had been deprived of the glory due him through the fall of Adam and through sin. And Jesus wanted to repair that and give God back the glory, his father, 
the glory that he was deprived of. So that love is is for the other person, and in this case, Jesus for his father. Now, Bishop Martinez has written a book, as we mentioned earlier, called The Sanctifier, one of the most amazing books about the Holy Spirit you'll ever read. And now his his understanding and love of the Holy Spirit is was a gift to the whole church. Mm -hmm. And an explanation even deeper of how this gift and grace of the divine wealth is able to be so fruitful in us. He identifies the Holy Spirit with love, right? And so let's see what we have, all right? And mm -hmm. that love is what now makes possible this mystical mm -hmm. incarnation. Lois? Okay. So the mystical incarnation unites our soul with the soul of Jesus, right? Unites our soul with God. And through love, again, this is all grace, through love, which means through an outpouring, a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a new disposition of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed into love, meaning our nature is changed we are transformed and one of the um, writers pointed out that the change is not just um, correcting us a little shoring us up a little you know making us a little bit better no the change is death and new life and so we're talking about a mystical death with Jesus and then the new life is the resurrection so it's very radical it's not just something um, smaller than that. It's, it's a radical death to self. He'll talk about it later. He talks about the important thing is the death to our ego so that Jesus's life in us can be expanded, meaning the Holy Spirit can um, guide us and lead us and dominate us, if you will, in every region eventually of our life, every part of our life. Now, I know for many of us in the divine will, as we try to understand how to enter into the depth of it, go to the bottom of the ocean of it, uh, or dissolve into it, all of those things sound very theological. And it's like, how do I, how do you do that? Right. And so, as Lois had just explained, this, this losing oneself in love with God is both the gift of the Holy Spirit. And something we in our human relationships long for, right? That is the peak experience of human love, to lose ourselves in love with the other, right? Exactly. And so exactly. the thing with that is our human love is just human, right? It'll take us maybe to a higher level of human love. But when God, through this grace of love, which is the divine will, helps us fall into the abyss of his love, right? Well, that is falling into the abyss of God himself, who is love. And so this, this has an utterly different effect in us, doesn't it, Lois? Exactly, exactly. And he talks earlier, Bishop Martinez talks earlier about that we now, the Holy Spirit now loves in us. So the command to, you know, love each other as you love yourself, right? Uh, little Therese actually explains this too, but Bishop Martinez says, we can love each other only because the Holy Spirit in us does the loving. It just surpasses human love because we can't love everybody humanly. You know, we can't love each, our brothers and sisters humanly, but with the gift of the Holy Spirit in us and growing in us because the life of Jesus in that annunciation, that incarnation, that life grows just like the life of Jesus grew when he was human on earth in the annunciation. That life is growing in us. And as it grows, in a certain sense, Bishop Martina says, uh, certainly in a certain sense, we are becoming love. We are becoming love because God's will is himself and God is love. So if we were going toward our original principle, like Aquinas would say, we become ourselves. You know, we go back to our original principle. We came from God. We're going back to God. So we're becoming more of who we were meant to be. And we were meant to be incarnated love like Jesus is 
It was incarnate love. Right. So we were created by God's love, yes. made of the nothingness of love. <laughs> yes, yes. All right? to, be, to become and go home in love. Exactly. And it's interesting, um, astrophysics that study the universe, they actually have said that the universe is made of love. The whole universe is made of love. Interesting. All right. And so uh, uh, when, when Bishop Martinez talks about the Song of Songs, all right, and, mm -hmm. and relates this to how, how uh, as we succumb to the seduction of God's love, all right, yield to his invitation of love, to let go of our human will and the guard we have against him, right? That he then has the void within us to be able to fill us with himself. Right? And, and in the, uh, the Song of Songs, he talks to us as his bride, mm -hmm. right? And yet speaks in a very surprising way, doesn't he, Lois? He does, exactly. Yes, he uses uh, a lot of the human terms that at first we think are romantic and all of that, but they're but they're used in the mystical language. They're so much deeper, and it's not a romance in the way that we think about it. It's a love that transcends that, that that goes into eternity. That was from all eternity. Even God has loved us and known us, totally known us, known everything we were going to do from all eternity. That that's a very difficult concept <clears throat> to understand. We take it by faith that God has known us <clears throat> and planned for us and waited for us and loved us. He does oh, with an espousal love, love, right? Yeah. He, he yeah. actually refers to us in this state of, of mm -hmm. givenness to, to God as, as brides of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Yes. And I, and I just love how how he refers uh, in 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 the Song of Songs to the the line that says, "To us, to the soul." God speaking to the soul, saying, "You have mm -hmm. stolen my heart, mm -hmm. my sister, my bride." Right? Mm -hmm. That we can possess God's heart, which we hear all over and over in the gift of the divine will in the Book of Heaven. Exactly. Right? So the soul that has the mystical incarnation has stolen God's heart. It's stolen the Holy Spirit from him and keeps it as a treasure in its own heart. Mm -hmm. And so the soul loves mm -hmm. with this divine heart. Exactly. Right? And, you know, to steal God's heart also means that now he is vulnerable to everything that we think or that we do regarding him, meaning when you love somebody very deeply on a human level, let's see, when you love somebody very deeply, the very smallest offense from them or unkind word or really anything, uh, insensitivity cuts deeper. So the very fact that we have stolen God's heart, as we're told in Song of Songs, means that now Everything that we do is going to impact him in a more profound way. It means we have to be more careful about our words and our actions. And more careful because now we have a heart that's in our hands that's vulnerable. That's a, that's a different concept. All right. And so now as Bishop Martinez goes deeper into this, uh, loving God's will, right, as yeah. a way of loving Jesus, becoming one with Jesus, and yeah. it plunges us into the mystery of Jesus Himself. But he talks about the mystery of the mystical incarnation, mm -hmm. in terms of disposing us, right, for all that is blessed, holy, and and beautiful, right, and for whatever may come in our lives. Mm -hmm. Talk about mm -hmm. this first, uh, diversity of 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 yeah. martyrdoms that we're all called, called to in our own lives. Exactly. What Bishop Martinez, he he penetrated, you know, the, such a depth of this, 
and he penetrated it to the point where what he was saying is, first of all, he was saying, whatever the will of God, whatever the divine will disposes for you is the absolute best. And we take that by faith, of course, right? But he's saying whatever God does with you, whether it's shadow or light, suffering or joy, whatever it is, he's only disposing the best and the best in terms of looking to eternity, looking to the purity of your soul, looking to um, what you really need to continue to grow in holiness, to continue to grow closer to the Lord. And I love what he says. He says, there's another level of this as, as he continues on. He says, there's another level where we don't only just, we don't only just find our rest in Jesus, but we become a place, our soul, where Jesus can find his rest in us. That's like a deeper, higher level of thinking about our relationship with Jesus. We think, oh, you know, I'm going to rest in Jesus. He's going to give me comfort. He's going to give me consolation. We don't as often, I believe, <laughs> as often think about, oh, Jesus is going to come. He lives in my soul already. Come to my soul. And he wants to rest. He wants to be listened to. He wants a companion. He wants our attention. Um, he wants us to console him and become his place where he can rest. Right? Where he now, can this rest. is a beautiful, beautiful um, connectedness uh, to his own uh, suffering, especially with at the loss of his mother, right? which was so profound a pain uh, that just brought him to tears for years. Right? Yes. And yet, yes. And yet this preparation, when he encountered Conchita, who, who had a mission of mother, not only to her own 12 children, but to mother to priests with Mary's own maternity. There was a whole maternal aspect to this mystical incarnation that he was understanding and being invited to, as you say, yeah. Yes. And we know in the divine will, we're encouraged to take whatever Mary did as our own. We yes. say that in our Virginian prayer. Mm -hmm. And how did, Mary, how did Mary love, right? And how does she love today? When we call on her, we ask her to enfold us in her mantle, right? Just hold us close to herself. And so this maternal love that you referred to so well, that Jesus mm -hmm. is to rest in, mm -hmm. as, and we just hold him within our heart as Mary does. Exactly, exactly. And many of the mystics have alluded to this and talked about this, that, you know, Jesus, like in the Blessed Sacrament, will suffer until the very end of time. He suffers in the church, in his people, he suffers. And we don't think of him as needing comfort, as being the poor one the one who suffers the most, we don't think of that. And so this gift and this understanding of the gift leads us to start seeing Jesus um, in his interior sufferings, not just from the second of his conception, which he talks about from the second of con his conception, he had thorns and, and lashes and the interior suffering, both mental and physical, but, but even now, as it's perpetuated in time, Jesus is still suffering here and now among us. And so as this gift matures and you understand that we are mothers to Jesus, we are mothers to souls, that is part of the gift. And we also are the ones that are offering up the sacrifice of Jesus with everything that we offer, every ordinary thing we do and every extraordinary thing that we do. We are offering up Jesus within us to the Father. We're renewing his sacrifice. And we're doing that, as Jesus told one mystic, I thought this is beautiful. He said to her, he said, you and I, you know, we're dying for humanity. We're dying, in other words, it's like what he was saying is all the suffering, all the trial, everything you're going through that right now, that's moving you dying again for your brothers and sisters. 
Yeah. Beautiful. And and I love that maternal image where Our Lady, who was right there at the foot of the cross in the in the Pietà, where he, she's just holding him, almost as offering to us the the, the banquet of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. That that wanting to share with him in every part of what he did, which he did, mm -hmm. inviting us to come with her and share his sorrow, share yeah. his love, right? And and there is that invitation uh, to a kind of maternal victimhood. Oh, not absolutely. One that be about pain, right? Absolutely. And, and think about the presentation when Simeon says to Mary, you know, yeah. the sword will pierce your own heart too. In terms of the suffering, what he was doing is saying, you know, the sufferings of this child that we have right here his sufferings will pierce your soul too. And in the MI, in the mystical incarnation and the divine will, which are the same, but in that, Louisa and Jesus makes it clear to Louisa that that is also what we are doing, that we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ, his interior sufferings, his exterior sufferings, but we, are, we have to share in that in the way that Mary had a share, she had a huge share, <laughs> you know, co-redemptress, co not meaning equal, but it means, um, you know, a strong relationship with, with the redemption. And we have a share in that, in this gift. And as this gift grows, sometimes that share, well, all the time, that share grows. <laughs> and we see that in Bishop Martinez's life. His sufferings were like on and on and on, Till the moment he died, very strong sufferings, very, very severe sufferings. Well, as he was being drawn into the very mission of the Jesus, he is now one with, right? Mm -hmm. And what was mm -hmm. Jesus' mission? But but through his love and giving of himself to the last drop of blood, yes. that outpouring of love, which was to uh, harmonize and bring order back to all of the universe and return to the Father, the love that had not come. Right? This is the mission of love, pure love, as St. John of the Cross would call it, right? Yes, yes. And it's mixed with that Bishop Martinez's life. It's mixed with such a beautiful humanity. Um, one story is when, when his mother died, this story is when his mother died, um, they loved each other very, very much, very dearly. And so, as you mentioned earlier, he suffered and he says, when I come to Jesus after my mother died, all I do is cry and pour out my heart, <laughs> you know, I come to Jesus. And when he was dying, when Bishop Martinez was dying and he went into that unconscious place where you're no longer conscious, but you can still talk, what he, who he was calling out is for his mother. He called out for his mother, said, mama, mama. And, and that's one of the ways, you know, that I think he exemplified that deep humanity with those deep sacred bonds that we have. And you see that in all the lives of the mystics, that deep humanity amidst their beautiful divine life and their mystical gifts and mystical life, you see that deep um, human one-to-one -one intimacy with the people that they have here. You life. know, and that's story. That story reminds me of, of when um, we brought Mary, uh, my wife Anne's mother, uh, Margaret, home with us in her last stages of brain cancer. Right? And so for weeks she, she spent time with us as we cared for her. And the days before her, for her death, uh, we had a little baby monitor that we could leer and watch her. And she would have her hands up in the air in her bed crying, mother, 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 over and over again. Yeah. And so this this primitive calling for mm -hmm. our mother, which is oh, now yes. you know, embodied in the Blessed Mother, right, as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's no inconsistency with being very close with your own human mother and very, very close with Mary as <laughs> your spiritual. <laughs> Those two definitely go together. And in this last prayer, you know, he's talking about 
that he gives the oblation of himself totally. And he says, basically, the Holy Spirit, without telling me, without asking me, without, you know, um, touching base with me at all, can do anything he wants with what is mine and, and with me and what is mine. And it's just this total self-donation put into words. You're saying to God, you don't even have to consult me. I don't have to understand what you're doing. I don't have to know beforehand what you're doing. I let go of all of that. You just do what you want to do. Your holy divine will, what you want to do. That's just a pinnacle of self donation and sacrifice um, in this gift of divine will. That's just a total pinnacle to get where you're saying, um, you don't even have to consult me. Just do what you want. And it's it's beautiful. And before before we read this this prayer as our our ending prayer for our session tonight, mm -hmm. I just would like to also note that that in the June of 1927, when he was experiencing that uh, mystical marriage that he spoke of, uh, and he was hiding in the garden, <laughs> all right, yes. that he was yes. reading. Little Flower story, the story of a soul, right? Yes. And and so he counted himself as one of the little victims of merciful love, saying how little he saw and how much he knew he didn't have his nothingness enough. Enough, so he wanted to just surrender into that nothing, mm -hmm. which is the, the the prerequisite for it, so that he could he could live in a single act of perfect love as the little flower did, exactly. right? And I believe this oblation that he left us is his firm commitment of will to do just that. And so as we pray this together now, as we say good night for our broadcast, I'd like you to just close your eyes. And as much as you are able through whatever sense of oneness with Christ, with however little nothing you can see yourself as, and with whatever determination you are able to muster in your will to say with determination and resolution that this is my one act of love for you, right? That he, he spoke this prayer. Oh, Holy Father. Oh, adorable Father. And through the immaculate heart and the hands of Mary, the most holy virgin, my mother, under the impulse of the Holy Spirit, and intimately united to Jesus, your son, immortal victim, I give to you today the total gift, the absolute oblation of myself, abandoning all to your sovereign will in order that this divine will without asking my opinion without taking me into account might do with me and all that is mine whatever it pleases my only support in making this oblation is your strength upon which my nothingness rests. I give you that which I can now give you, my will, sincere and complete, and I cast myself into your sovereign will. Amen. Amen. And Dr. Lois, would you like to have any concluding comment before we say goodnight? I think the concluding comment, I guess I would I would say rest, you know, rest in Jesus. You know, I would I would ask people to rest in Jesus and um, and let him rest in you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good night Amen. and fiat.